set in December 2012. This speech details what we believe the president might say on the day America's foreign creditors finally stop lending us money and demand repayment for our country's debts, the largest debts ever accumulated in the history of mankind. Our politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, believe this day will never come. Meanwhile, the world's biggest bond investor, the world's leading real estate investor, the International Monetary Fund, and our number one creditor, the Chinese, say otherwise. Seven PM Eastern Standard Time, December fourth, twenty twelve. From the East Room of the White House. My fellow Americans, as you are now well aware, the events that transpired today are unprecedented in our nation's history. The stock market and the nation's banks will be closed for at least the next five business days. And the U.S. dollar has essentially collapsed because our foreign creditors have refused to buy dollar-denominated debt at any price. We have several important issues to discuss this evening, but I want to first make it clear that these events are not the result of one or two presidential terms, nor the result of just a handful of congressional decisions. These problems have been systemic in U.S. policy for decades, and I'd like to take a minute to explain the origin of today's collapse so we are all on the same page moving forward. You see, a little more than 40 years ago, the value of the U.S. dollar was tied directly to the price of gold. In other words, you could show up at a bank with your dollars and exchange them for gold. But on August 15, 1971, Republican President Richard Nixon severed that tie, and by 1973, the value of the dollar fluctuated freely against other world currencies. Since then, it's been a bumpy ride, with wild swings in the value of the U.S. dollar, both up and down. But in roughly the past decade, the value of our currency, the U.S. dollar, has basically been in steep decline. Look at the chart I've prepared. When I first took office in 2009, my administration inherited the toughest economic situation we've seen since the Great Depression, including an economy that shed more than two million jobs. And in the ensuing years, the situation got even worse for the economy and for the U.S. dollar. In early 2011, the International Monetary Fund issued a stern warning that we as Americans would face a severe shock if we could not get our debt under control. Around the same time, the Wall Street Journal ran an article titled Why the Dollar's Reign is Near an End. The rating agency Moody's followed up with a warning about a downgrade to the credit rating of the United States government. And finally, Chinese central bank official Li Dao Kuo said we were playing with fire regarding our debt limits. You might not think it's important what officials from China and other Asian nations say, but it is. In fact, very important because China and Japan lend us more money than the next 10 countries combined. But even with these warnings, As little as a year ago, the U.S. dollar was still fully functioning as the world's most important currency. Back then, 85% of foreign exchange transactions around the world involved the U.S. dollar. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, set the price of oil in dollars. And more than 60% of the foreign reserves of central banks and governments around the globe were held in U.S. dollars. Today, none of these things are true. Despite our best efforts, The situation has gotten much worse than anyone in my administration could have anticipated. I am sorry to report I could not do anything to stop this crisis. The extent of this collapse was simply beyond our capabilities. And I don't want to sugarcoat it. The situation is likely to get worse, much worse, before it gets better. As I mentioned, all U.S. stock markets will be closed for at least the remainder of this week. You will not be able to buy or sell U.S. securities until the markets reopen, and all U.S. banking institutions will be closed for the rest of the week as well. You will not be able to withdraw money, write checks, or access safety deposit boxes. We don't yet know when the markets or the banks will reopen. In addition, because the U.S. dollar is now basically worthless in the world market, the prices for basic goods and services in America, which were already climbing rapidly over the past few years, have recently jumped off the charts. Take the price of a gallon of gasoline, for example. 
According to the Energy Administration Association, the price of a gallon of gasoline went up only 20% in 10 years between 1990 and 2000. But between the beginning of 2009 and early 2011, prices shot up 125%. And since our debt ceiling agreement of last year, prices have shot up another 150%. Gas for the average American now costs more than $7 per gallon. Prices for nearly everything have skyrocketed versus the dollar. How high prices will go is anyone's guess. Because our federal government has to do some major reconfiguring for the foreseeable future, all non-essential government services will come to an immediate halt, and even many critical services will operate on a drastically reduced basis. Mail service, for example, will operate just once a week on Wednesdays. Veterans hospitals will be accepting emergency patients only, and freedom cards The government's food program for lower-income Americans will not be accepted for the next seven days. As drastic as these steps may seem, they are necessary because we simply must get our fiscal house in order. We must ensure the stability of the U.S. dollar. Failing to do so could be catastrophic for our country's future. I also want to make it clear that even in a time of crisis, we are putting the American people's safety first. The U.S. National Guard is on full orange alert at key positions throughout the country. And I have been in close contact this afternoon with our allies in Canada, Mexico, France, and Great Britain, just to name a few. They are prepared to step in with military and humanitarian aid if necessary. For Americans who do not have necessary supplies or money to last until the banks and other financial institutions reopen, we have arranged more than 150 temporary shelters nationwide where you will find food, water, and emergency medical care. I also want to make one thing clear. This is not the time to panic. The American people have been through difficult times before. It's important to remember that we are all in this together. And that is why my goal in addressing you this evening is twofold. First, I'd like to clarify the facts of exactly what happened today. There are wild rumors being spread, especially on the Internet. And I want to set the record straight. Second, I want to talk about what we are doing to solve this problem, to ensure the stability of our currency, the U.S. dollar, and to prevent this problem from occurring in the future. So first, let's recap the day's events. At around 8 a.m. this morning, U.S. Treasury officials reported that the Treasury Automated Auction Processing System, or TAPS, received no bids in yesterday's government bond auction. What many Americans don't realize is that for many years, our country has depended on investors to give the U.S. Treasury billions of dollars every single week just to keep our government operating. Most of our creditors are foreign governments, like the Chinese and Japanese. With our total debt now in excess of $15 trillion, the U.S. Treasury's weekly funding demands now routinely exceeds $100 billion. The size of these debts means that there are very few investors anywhere in the world big enough to provide us with the credit we need. And, apparently, none of those regular lenders appeared yesterday afternoon on TAPS. In other words, as of 7.30 a.m. this morning, there were no bids to buy U.S. Treasuries at any price. In other words, our line of credit was essentially cut off. I spent the morning speaking on the phone with the central bankers of our largest creditors, officials in China, Japan, Great Britain, Brazil, Canada, Taiwan, and Russia. We have several discussions in the works, although I am not privileged to say much more about these talks at the moment. It appears for the moment these countries are not willing to purchase any more U.S. government debt at any price. Of course, This U.S. Treasury auction failure set up a swift panic in the financial markets earlier today. When I instructed the Treasury Secretary to close the New York Stock Exchange at 12 noon, the market as a whole had dropped 37% in just the first two and a half hours of trading on that day. Soon after, I met with the Federal Reserve Board and we instructed all banking institutions to close at 2 p.m., until further notice, to avoid a run on the U.S. dollar. 
Dozens of banks across the country reported long lines of depositors wishing to withdraw their savings, and many of these banks simply ran out of cash. The reason the markets have reacted this way is simple. U.S. Treasury bonds are the foundation of the world's monetary system. Hundreds of various financial instruments, everything from mortgage rates in the United States to value of stocks in Bangladesh, use the U.S. Treasury market as a key reference. The price of nearly everything all around the world depends on what investors are willing to spend on U.S. Treasury bonds. And right now, there are no investors big enough to lend us the money we need. It has basically turned the entire financial world upside down. So what will happen next? Well, that's the second part of what I want to discuss with you tonight. First, I want to reiterate that now is not the time to panic. Yes, the situation is bad, very bad. But we are working to get things under control, and we will take every step necessary to get the financial system up and running once again. I have been hearing reports all day about selfish individuals cleaning out store shelves, emptying their bank accounts, and even preparing to flee the country. In Phoenix, for example, we heard reports of a mob overwhelming a gas station employee. In Chicago, my hometown, I read a report about how a mob apparently overran a grocery store and actually held the employees hostage while they stole thousands of dollars worth of goods. Read my lips. Financial crisis or not, if you break the law in this country, you will be caught and you will be brought to justice. For this reason, I have also instituted martial law in the United States for the next seven days and a 10 p.m. curfew nationwide. Members of all four military branches have been deployed to secure government buildings and other sensitive locations and to maintain order. Of course, as I mentioned, the most important thing we need to do right now is to get our fiscal house in order. To do that, it is critical that each of us makes our best attempt to go about our business as usual. Hoarding food, gasoline, or medical supplies, and protesting in front of banks or other financial institutions is not going to help the situation. Our number one priority right now is to ensure the stability of the U.S. dollar so that we can get the wheels of the financial markets and commerce moving again. And that is why my cabinet members and I have come up with a three-step plan, which is already being put into place. Step number one is to find investors who are willing to purchase U.S. Treasuries. We have reached out so far, for example, to the oil-exporting nations of Ecuador, Venezuela, Libya, Nigeria, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. We will have answers from these nations shortly on what they may be able to bring to the table as far as purchasing U.S. Treasuries. We have also instituted a policy of, effective immediately, requiring all public and private U.S. pensions to hold at least 20% of their assets in U.S. Treasuries. This will be part of Executive Order 13550 and will soon be taken up by Congress as part of the Retirement Account Allegiance Act. This executive order gives all Americans the opportunity to help our government in a time of great need. A significant portion of all retirement accounts, public and private, will now go to purchase U.S. Treasuries. Step two is to begin the immediate liquidation of some of our most valued non-essential assets, including the Hoover Dam. Yellowstone Park, and certain drilling rights to the Gulf of Mexico. I spent more than an hour on the phone this morning with investors from Brazil, Russia, and Canada who are interested in purchasing these federally owned assets and more. We are also preparing to liquidate 50% of the gold holdings at Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's vault in Manhattan. As you probably know, gold prices climbed nearly 100% today and with gold trading at well over $3,000 per ounce. We expect to be able to raise a substantial amount of money by selling a portion of our holdings. These sales will commence within the next 24 hours. Step three is to boost revenue immediately. For this reason, we are temporarily doubling the federal income tax rates at all levels of income, 
and disallowing all tax deductions. This means that if your federal income tax rate before today was 10%, it will be 20% from now until at least the end of 2015. If your rate before today was 35%, your new rate will now be 70% until at least the end of 2015. This balanced approach asks everyone to give without requiring anyone to sacrifice too much. At the same time, we have completely eliminated all taxes on lower income families and plan to double the size of the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program once we have gotten the financial system working again. Never has a government of this nation been responsible for taking care of so many. That is something we should all be proud of. By raising all federal tax rates across the board, we have an equitable solution for all Americans to carry their share of the burden in this time of crisis. Please keep in mind that these new tax rates go into effect retroactively, dating back to the beginning of the present calendar year. Every taxpaying U.S. citizen will need to file a new Form 1049 with the Internal Revenue Service within the next 30 days to make back payments and ensure that enough money is being withheld from your current pay. Fellow citizens, I know these actions may seem drastic, but again, desperate times call for desperate measures. If we choose not to take these drastic steps, there is no telling where this financial crisis could lead. Now is the time to put country above self and set personal grievances aside for the greater good. Let us remember the Americans who held this country together during its most difficult hours, who put aside pride and party to form a more perfect union. That's what I am asking of you, the American people, today. For even in the midst of this crisis, I believe in my heart that America remains the greatest country on earth. And while we may be down, we are by no means out. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. Hi, my name is Porter Stansberry. The speech you just heard is a fictional dramatization of what I believe is very likely to happen in the near future. You see, I have been following the story closely for more than three years now, and while this was fiction, the issues and facts behind it are very real. First, I want to state this as firmly and plainly as I can. We are about to experience a major financial crisis with our currency and our runaway deficit in the United States, and it will culminate in a day that's very much like the dramatization you just watched. And this is a problem that cannot be fixed without radical changes to our standard of living. Of course, the sad part is most Americans have no idea this is about to happen. They are totally unprepared. We are now seeing radical changes take place right before our very eyes as the prices of food, oil, and other commodities like cotton, copper, sugar, corn, aluminum, steel, and wheat absolutely skyrocket. But none of this should be a surprise. You see, I started issuing my warnings about a coming crisis in late 2008, just after the financial crisis erupted on Wall Street. I saw what was happening, how the government was transferring all of Wall Street's bad debts into the U.S. Treasury. Then, a few months later, in March of 2009, when the Federal Reserve began printing trillions of dollars to paper over these debts, I knew we would face a serious currency crisis and massive inflation. Finally, when the Fed turned on the printing presses again in the fall of 2010, I decided to take my warnings to the public in the form of these presentations. Since then, the crisis has begun to erupt all around the world. People across the globe, and even here in America, are now realizing that the promises made to them in the form of pensions, health care, and contracts are essentially worthless when your government is broke, when it has to print trillions of new dollars merely to finance its existing obligations. That's why I created my first video presentation outlining this problem in November of last year. Since then, more than 16 million people have watched my presentation about what is going on and what steps you can take to protect yourself and your family. Today, I'd like to bring you up to speed and to show you what you can do about the situation before it's too late. Believe me, I have no interest in trying to scare you, but this is all happening very fast, and I strongly encourage you to get the facts so you can make a decision for yourself. You know, 
My guess is that as you are watching the fictional dramatization of what I believe could soon happen in America, you are probably saying to yourself, there's no way this could really happen, not here, but just remember. That's exactly what most people were saying three years ago when I told them the world's largest mortgage bankers, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, would soon go bankrupt. And that's exactly what most people thought when I said one of America's largest and most famous companies, General Motors, would soon be bankrupt as well. And that the same would happen to General Growth Properties, the biggest owner of mall property in America. The point is, we have entered a new era in America, one in which seemingly impossible events are now occurring on a regular basis. And that brings us to today and what I want to talk about specifically, the most important problem America is facing right now. The same financial problems I've been tracking from bank to bank, from company to company for the last five years have now found their way into the U.S. Treasury. From our Treasury, this massive crisis was spread around the globe via the Federal Reserve because the U.S. dollar is the foundation of the world's banking system. Our inflation is being spread from country to country, upsetting food and energy prices and sparking revolts. These troubles will find their way back to America, too, as people who are dependent on government pensions, fixed incomes, and government contracts find themselves impoverished by skyrocketing prices and broken promises. As an American, it is critically important for you to understand how all of this will play out. In short, you must understand the facts and the enormous risks we face. As I see it, the next phase in this crisis, which is already well underway, will threaten our very way of life. The savings of millions will be wiped out. This disaster will change your business and your work. It will dramatically affect your savings accounts, investments, and retirement. It will change everything about your normal way of life, where you vacation, where you send your kids or grandkids to school, how and where you shop, the way you protect your family and home. I'll explain how these events are playing out now and how I believe they will continue. You can decide for yourself if I'm full of hot air. As for me, I'm more certain about this looming crisis than I've been about anything else in my life. I know that debts don't just disappear. I know that bailouts have big consequences. And unlike most of the pundits on TV, I know a lot about finance and accounting. Of course, the most important part of this situation is not what is happening, but rather what you can do about it. In other words, will you be prepared? Don't worry, I'm not organizing a rally or demonstration, and I've turned down every request to run for political office. Instead, I want to show you exactly what strategies I'm using to protect and even grow my own money and how you can prepare as well. Will you know what to do as commodity prices, things like milk, bread, and gasoline, continue to soar in price? Will you know what to do when banks close, when your credit cards stop working, or when you're not allowed to buy gold or foreign currencies, or when food stamps fail? In short, our way of life in America is about to change. In fact, for many, it is already changing. I promise you, this is far from over. It is only just beginning. In this presentation, I'll show you exactly what is happening. In fact, if you think I'm being an alarmist, look at this. Sam Zell, the 60th richest man in America, according to Forbes magazine, and one of the world's best investors, did a rare interview with CNBC. Here's what he said. My single biggest financial concern is the loss of the dollar as the reserve currency. I can't imagine anything more disastrous to our country. I'm hoping against hope that ain't going to happen, but you're already seeing things in the markets that are suggesting that confidence in the dollar is waning. I think you could see a 25% reduction and the standard of living in this country if the U.S. dollar was no longer the world's reserve currency. That's how valuable it is. This is very scary stuff, which not one in a thousand Americans fully understands. I believe our country is in the midst of a major collapse in our national monetary system and our normal way of life. Basically, for many years now, our government has been borrowing so much money, very often using short-term loans, that very soon we will no longer be able to afford even the interest on these loans. Again, 
I say these things as an expert in accounting and financial research. Just look at the simple math, which we've updated here using the Congressional Budget Office's January 2011 report. These are not pie-in-the-sky numbers. These are not future obligations. I'm talking about the debts our government owes today, right now. Income tax receipts are roughly $900 billion a year. Corporate taxes are roughly $200 billion annually. Our current annual deficits are nearly $1.3 trillion. So even if you doubled tax revenue, we would still be running a deficit of more than $100 billion a year. The point here is simple. Even if all U.S. citizens were taxed 100% of their income, it would still not be enough to balance the federal budget. We'd still have to borrow money just to maintain the status quo. That's absolutely incredible, isn't it? And here is the part that really matters. The costs of maintaining our debts are about to skyrocket. Right now, the Federal Reserve is manipulating interest rates down to almost zero. As a result, the interest rate at which the government can borrow money is at a record low level, less than 1.5%. Obviously, this won't last forever. But the question is, how much will we have to spend in interest to actually afford the money we have already borrowed? Right now, we're only paying about $200 billion a year in interest. That's around 15% of federal tax receipts. But if you assume a real market-based rate of interest, the federal government might have to spend 6% to cover its debt. In that case, we would be spending $840 billion a year in interest, or 76% of tax receipts. And that's just the interest on the debt we owe right now, today. I'm not including any of the future debts we will surely incur. It should be obvious to you that we're facing a deadly serious crisis. Obviously, we can't afford to spend 77% of tax receipts on interest payments. Just as obviously, we can't continually print trillions and trillions of new dollars to fund our debts. We are trapped. There is no way out. Nobody in Washington, not Republicans, not Democrats, not even Tea Partiers, want you to realize how precarious our government's finances really are. They can't afford for you to understand this dilemma or what it means. The problem is, even before this crisis, our government was deeply in debt. With each additional commitment, we sink further and further into debt, closing in upon the moment that we can simply no longer afford even the interest payments on our obligations. According to even my most conservative calculations, again, using numbers provided by the Congressional Budget Office, a debt default by the U.S. government would be inevitable were it not for one simple anomaly, the one thing that has saved the United States so far. I'm talking about our country's unique ability to simply print more money. You see, the U.S. government has one very important weapon to use in this crisis. It is the only debtor in the world who can legally print U.S. dollars. And the U.S. dollar is what's known as the world's reserve currency. The dollar forms the basis of the world's financial system. It is what banks around the world hold in reserve against their loans. That's a secret that most politicians don't understand. As things stand right now, the U.S. government can't go broke in any ordinary sense of the word because it can simply print dollars to pay for its bad debts. It's been doing so since March of 2009. That might sound pretty good at first. Since we can always just print more money, what is there to worry about? Well, let me show you. You see, as things stand today, America is the only country in the world that doesn't have to pay for its imports or its debts in a foreign currency. Let's say you're a German and you want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. You can't just pay for your oil in German marks or the new euro currency because the oil is priced in dollars. So you have to buy dollars first, then buy your oil. And that means the value of the German currency is of great importance to the German government. To maintain the value of its currency, Germans must produce at least as much as they consume from around the world. Otherwise, the value of its currency will begin to fall, causing prices to rise and its standard of living to decline. But in America, we've been able to consume as much as we want without worrying about acquiring the money to pay for it because our dollars are accepted everywhere around the world. In short, 
for decades now, we haven't had to produce anything or export anything to get all the dollars we needed to buy all the oil and other goods our country required. All we had to do was borrow and print more money. And boy, did we. Take a look at this chart. Even as late as the 1970s, America was the world's largest creditor. But by the mid-1980s, we'd become a debtor to the world. And since the late 1990s, we've been the world's largest debtor. Today, our government owes more money to more people than anyone else in the world. And that was before the financial crisis. With all of these bad debts piling up, we've had to begin repaying our debts by printing trillions of new dollars. And now, finally, the impact of this is being felt in a big way. As our creditors continue to figure out what's happening, we're going to have very, very big problems. As we demonstrated in the fictitious newscast, I believe our creditors, which includes foreign countries and other investors here and abroad, will either completely stop accepting dollars in repayment or greatly discount the value of these new dollars. This will make our consumption-led way of life impossible to afford, and I'm confident it will lead to an end of the U.S. dollar standard. Keep in mind, the U.S. dollar has been the world's reserve currency for decades now, so most Americans don't have a clue about what the repercussions are of losing this status. And maybe you think it could never happen, but the truth is, this is exactly what happens when countries get too far in debt or when they consume too much or produce too little. In fact, the exact same thing happened to Great Britain in the 1970s. Most people don't know this, but British sterling was the reserve currency for most of the world for nearly 200 years, for most of the 18th and 19th centuries. It continued to play this role until after World War II, when America was forced to prop up Britain's economy with foreign aid. Remember the famous Marshall Plan, when we gave billions to help European countries rebuild? Unfortunately, though, Britain pursued a socialist national agenda. The government took over all of the major industries. Like Barack Obama, Britain's leaders wanted to spread the wealth around. Pretty soon, the country was flat broke. The final straw for Britain came in 1967, when things got so bad, the Labour Party, the Socialists, decided to devalue the British currency by 14% overnight. They believed this would make it easier for people to afford their debts. In reality, what it did was make anyone holding British sterling 14% poorer overnight and it made everything in Britain much, much more expensive in the coming years. And, for the country as a whole, it ushered in one of the worst decades in modern British history. Most Americans don't know about Britain's winter of discontent in the late 1970s, when the government put a freeze on wages. There were continuous strikes in nearly every sector, grave diggers, trash collectors, even hospital workers, in 1975, inflation in Britain skyrocketed 26.9% in a single year. The government also imposed what was known as the three-day week in 1974. In short, businesses were limited to using electricity for only three specified consecutive days each week, and they were prohibited from working longer hours on those days. Television companies were required to cease broadcasting at 10.30 p.m. to save electricity, just how bad were things exactly? Well, here's a photo of the garbage that piled up because they didn't have enough money to pay trash collectors a fair wage. Imagine, Britain was a global superpower for 150 years, but when they started intentionally devaluing their currency, things went straight downhill. Maybe you don't think something similar can happen here, but I'm telling you, it's already underway. In fact, the exchange value of the U.S. dollar has fallen about 13% since June 2010, and its rate of decline is accelerating. What happened to the British currency is now happening to the U.S. dollar. As Barron's recently reported, when the monetary history is written decades from now, 2010 could be a watershed marking the beginning of the end of the dollar-based Western-centric monetary system. As the U.S. dollar continues to lose its position as the world's currency, gas, oil, and other commodities will continue to skyrocket. Almost everything we consume will immediately get more expensive. 
all the clothing, furniture, and household goods we import from China, all the food we get from Central and South America, all the electronics, television, computers, and cars we get from Asia and Europe. In fact, it's happening right now before our eyes. Everything is getting more expensive. A Wall Street Journal article recently showed that of the 88 commodity items the paper tracks, 85 items were more expensive than they were just a year ago, many significantly so. Oil is up more than 50% from a year ago. Silver is up more than 100%. So is cotton and coffee. Tin is up 90%. Oats are up more than 70%. So is wheat. Butter is up more than 40%. So is sugar. Again, of the 88 prices quoted, the only three physical commodities that are cheaper today than they were a year ago, natural gas, eggs, and chickens. Everything is more expensive, in some cases, much more expensive. And yet the government says there is no inflation. How is that possible? It's unbelievable to me that they think the American public is going to fall for this. U.S. businesses have certainly caught on. As Wesley Card, the head of a clothing company that includes brands like Dockers and Ann Klein, recently said, it's really a no-choice situation. Prices have to come up. And when you look back further than a year, the numbers are even more startling. This chart shows how much a few key commodities have skyrocketed in price just since the beginning of 2009. And the point here is simple. As we print more money, the price of the world's most essential commodities have soared. This is not a coincidence. Around the world, as we print, prices soar. Citizens protest, governments get overthrown, and it's only going to get worse because we cannot stop printing because we can't actually afford our existing debts. No one wants you to know this. No one. That's why, despite the obvious inflation going on all around the world, the Fed continues to say there's no inflation at all. And that's the scary part to me. Just like in a banana republic, the government is radically devaluing the dollar and totally lying to everyone about what is really happening. Whether you realize it or not, there is already a run on the dollar. Many of our creditors, like the Chinese, are getting out of the dollar as fast as they can via strategic commodities like copper. That's partly why commodity prices are soaring. Unfortunately, skyrocketing commodity prices are just the beginning. There are other disastrous consequences to the U.S. dollar losing status as the world's currency. For example, there would be much less demand for U.S. dollars around the globe, so interest rates will skyrocket. Already, just look how quickly rates have moved up in recent months. Instead of getting a mortgage at today's low rates of 5%, it may soon cost you 8% or even 10% or 15%. Imagine what that would do to housing prices. Stock prices will likely plummet by at least 40% in a matter of weeks as a result of this event in the currency markets. It will cost every American business a lot more money for supplies and materials. No one will be able to get a loan, and no bank will want to make loans. In short, when the U.S. dollar loses its spot as the world's reserve currency, it will cause a brutal downturn in the economy, which I expect will be about 10 times worse than the mortgage crisis of 2008. As Barron's recently reported, the demand for dollars from the rest of the world has been of an estimable benefit to the U.S. economy. It quite simply allows Americans to consume more than they produce and save less than they invest. In other words, to live beyond our means. You see, what will also happen as a result of this currency crisis and the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency will be massive inflation, the likes of which we have never seen before. When everyone is trying to get rid of their dollars, the government is printing more and more to pay debts, and no one wants to own them, the crisis will reach epic proportions. Remember, we as Americans are not immune to the basic laws of economics and finance. Over the past 100 years, many other governments have tried to do what our government is doing today, that is, printing money to pay for insurmountable debts. 
And in the past 100 years, this type of inflation and debt crisis has reared its ugly head in Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, the Ukraine, Japan, and China, just to name a few. Iceland went bankrupt recently. Greece is falling apart. Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain are all in trouble. And now the same process is well underway in the United States. As George Mellon of the Wall Street Journal reported in late February of this year, indeed, it is unlikely that Americans themselves will escape the inflationary consequences of current Fed policy. The Fed is financing a vast and rising federal deficit following a practice that has been a surefire prescription for domestic inflation from time immemorial. If you don't believe these problems are already happening in America, just take a look. Soon after I published my presentation last fall, Meredith Whitney, one of the most respected analysts on Wall Street, went on the CBS News program 60 Minutes and predicted that you could see 50 sizable local government bond defaults. 50 to 100 sizable defaults. More. This will amount to hundreds of billions of dollars worth of defaults. And if this happens, it will instantly become much more expensive, if not impossible, for state and local governments to borrow money, which means thousands of people could lose their jobs and hundreds of programs could be shut down overnight. Whitney added, The most alarming thing about the state issue is the level of complacency. It has tentacles as wide as anything I've seen. I think next to housing, this is the single most important issue in the United States and certainly the largest threat to the U.S. economy. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie confirmed that this problem is going on all over the country. He told 60 Minutes, It's not like you can avoid it forever, because it's here now. And we all know it's here. And the federal government doesn't have the money to paper over it anymore, either for the states. The day of reckoning has arrived. That's it. And it's going to arrive everywhere. Timing will vary a little bit, depending on which state you're in, but it's coming. We spent too much on everything. We spent too much. We spent money we didn't have. We borrowed money just crazily. The credit card maxed out, and it's over. It's over. The New York Times reported this weekend that New Jersey's total unfunded liability over the next 30 years has now surpassed $100 billion. That's why Christie and other governors around the country are now introducing bills to slash pension benefits to government employees. This would have been completely unthinkable just a few years ago, but now it's happening all over the country. There are huge state pension problems in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Connecticut, Hawaii, Alaska, West Virginia, Massachusetts, Delaware. The list goes on and on. And the truly amazing thing is that the U.S. federal government is in even worse shape than the local governments. The only reason we haven't seen the full brunt of this crisis yet on the federal level is because we've just continued to pile on more and more debt. The states can't print money, but the federal government can, at least for now. And for the moment, this is all that is preventing a currency collapse of unprecedented proportions. And this is the important point. What most people don't realize is that the U.S. government can only continue printing dollars as long as the U.S. dollar remains the world's reserve currency. I can't stress this enough. You need to act now in order to protect your assets and grow your savings in the next few years. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you exactly how I'm protecting my own money and what I recommend doing with your own. But first, let me show you what exactly is going on right now. Like I said, most Americans don't believe the U.S. dollar could ever lose its spot as the world's reserve currency. But I'm here to tell you, this process is already well underway. For example, although it went almost completely unreported in the U.S. press, last fall, a group of the world's most powerful countries, including China, Japan, Russia, and France, got together for a secret meeting without the United States being present or even knowing about the meeting. Veteran Middle East reporter Robert Fisk reported on this in Britain's independent newspaper. In the most profound financial change in recent Middle East history, Gulf Arabs are planning, 
along with China, Russia, Japan, and France, to end dollar dealings for oil, moving instead to a basket of currencies, including the Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, the euro, gold, and a new unified currency planned for nations and the Gulf Cooperation Council, including Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, and Qatar. Fisk also interviewed a Chinese banker who said, These plans will change the face of international financial transactions. America and Britain must be very worried. You will know how worried by the thunder of denials this news will generate. And sure enough, after Fisk published the details of this secret meeting, U.S. officials and central bankers from around the globe denied these plans. But, as the old central banking adage goes, how do you know exactly when a currency will be devalued? The answer? Right after the head of the central bank goes on television to adamantly deny that any such transaction will occur. And guess who just went public in recent weeks with a statement about how the U.S. will never devalue its currency? Yes, you guessed it. U.S. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. You see, the last thing a central banker wants to do in the midst of a devaluation is to give people a warning before he can devalue. So they have to deny, deny, deny. After the announcement is made, it's too late for citizens and investors to get out. I reported on this secret meeting last fall. And then, just a few weeks ago, a major international organization announced a big push for the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. On Thursday, February the 10th, the International Monetary Fund issued a report on a possible replacement for the dollar as the world's reserve currency. CNN reported the story. I'm sure you recognize the significance of this event. The IMF, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., is the intergovernmental organization that oversees the global financial system. They are the most influential financial organization in the world economy. The IMF has proposed replacing the U.S. dollar with something called Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs. SDRs represent potential claims on the currencies of IMF members. SDRs were created by the IMF in 1969 and can be converted into any currency based on a weighted basket of international currencies. When the IMF lends money, it typically does so via SDRs. The IMF also proposed creating SDR-denominated bonds, which could reduce central banks' dependence on U.S. Treasuries. The fund also suggested that certain assets, such as oil and gold, which are traded in U.S. dollars, could be priced using SDRs. This is a huge and important step to replace the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. It's just another sign of the growing trend. Any government or investor with any sense is looking to get out of the U.S. dollar as quickly and safely as possible. For example, Russia and China have announced an interesting agreement recently. To settle their ordinary trading of about $50 billion per year, they will no longer convert to U.S. dollars. You see, it used to be that China had to obtain dollars to buy gas supplies from Russia, but not anymore. And Russia no longer needs U.S. dollars to buy stuff from China. And this brings us to one of the biggest and most important facts regarding the U.S. dollar. As the dollar loses its place as the world's reserve currency, foreign countries will no longer need to maintain large holdings of our dollars. This means we will no longer be able to print as much money as we want. This move would have been unthinkable 10 years ago, but today it is the new reality. As I am sure you are aware, for years the U.S. dollar has been accepted almost universally around the globe. Heck, many times when I've traveled, I never even bothered to convert to the local currency because I knew everyone would take my dollars. Well, that's simply not the case anymore. Reuters reports that the same thing has happened in 2008 in one of Europe's most popular tourist spots. Currency exchange outlets in Amsterdam have been reportedly turning away customers who want to exchange their U.S. dollars for euros. As one traveling American told the Reuters news agency, Our dollar 
dollar is worth maybe zero over here. It's hard to find a place to exchange. We have to go downtown to the central station or post office. In India, the country's tourism minister said in 2008 the U.S. dollars will no longer be accepted at the country's heritage tourist sites like the Taj Mahal. And the U.S. dollar is no longer good anywhere in Cuba. The New York Times reports that now, many shops in China no longer accept dollar-based credit cards issued by foreign banks, and foreigners cannot convert American dollars into renminbi beyond a given quota. Iran, of course, has already moved all of its reserves out of U.S. dollars, and Kuwait depegged its currency from the dollar a few years ago. Bloomberg News recently reported that China and Russia plan to start trading in each other's currencies to diminish the dollar's role in global trade. Banu Bawija of UBS Bank said, given the risk to the dollar and U.S. assets from their fiscal position, they want to reduce their dependence on the dollar as an invoicing currency. And now is the time. Just look at the actions taken by the smartest investors. Bill Gross, who probably knows as much about currencies and debt as anyone in the world, runs the world's biggest bond fund. He was quoted by Bloomberg saying, We've told all of our clients that if you only had one idea, one investment, it would be to buy an investment in a non-dollar currency. That should be on top of the list. And Jim Rogers, one of the world's most successful multimillionaire investors, writes, The dollar is not just in decline. It's a mess. If something isn't done soon, I believe the dollar could lose its status as the world's reserve currency and medium of exchange, something that would lead to a huge decline in the standard of living for U.S. citizens like nothing we've seen in nearly a century. I know you probably still don't believe it can happen here in the United States, but think about it. Are we as Americans really immune to the laws of economics and finance? I don't think so. And every circumstance I know of in which a government has tried to inflate its debts away has ended in disaster. It will happen here too. As Jim Rogers says, history teaches us that such imprudent monetary and fiscal behavior has always led to economic disaster. This is why World Bank President Robert Zolik, in a speech at the School for Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University, recently said, The United States would be mistaken to take for granted the dollar's place as the world's predominant reserve currency. Looking forward, there will increasingly be other options to the dollar. And this is why the International Monetary Fund recently called for a new global currency. This is also why big U.S. companies like McDonald's and Caterpillar have begun introducing what are called dim sum bonds. These are securities denominated in the Chinese currency, the renminbi, by non-Chinese borrowers. In other words, Two of the biggest and most successful corporations in America realize they would have an easier time raising money by offering their bonds in a currency other than the U.S. dollar. Do you see where this is all heading? This is why gold and silver prices are soaring. The point is, it's not a matter of if the U.S. dollar will lose its status as the world's reserve currency. It's a process that is already underway. Investors, foreign governments, and large corporations No, there are serious, serious problems with the U.S. dollar. So they are fleeing to precious metals, which have historically been very reliable when a country has major currency problems. The good news is, no matter what happens, I've found several ways for you to protect your savings. And you could even make three to five times your money over the next few years. I'll show you exactly what to do in a moment. But first, let me explain why the collapse of the dollar as the world's reserve currency could happen much sooner than most people expect. I know many of my friends, colleagues, and family members are still in serious denial. In the world of psychology, they call this the normalcy bias. You see, the normalcy bias actually refers to our natural reactions when facing a crisis. The normalcy bias causes smart people to underestimate the possibility of a disaster and its effects. Basically, people believe that since something has never happened before, it never will. We are all guilty of it. It's just human nature. The normalcy bias also makes people unable to deal with a disaster once it has occurred. Basically, people have a really hard time preparing for 
and dealing with something they have never experienced. The normalcy bias often results in unnecessary deaths and disaster situations. For example, think about the Jewish populations of World War II. As Barton Biggs reports in his book, Wealth, War, and Wisdom, by the end of 1935, 100,000 Jews had left Germany, but 450,000 still remained. Wealthy Jewish families kept thinking and hoping that the worst was over. Many of the German Jews, brilliant, cultured, and cosmopolitan as they were, were too complacent. They had been in Germany so long and were so well established, they simply couldn't believe that there was going to be a crisis that would endanger them. They were too comfortable. They believed the Nazis' anti-Semitism was an episodic event and that Hitler's bark was worse than his bite. They reacted sluggishly to the rise of Hitler for completely understandable but tragically erroneous reasons. Events moved much faster than they could imagine. This is one of the most tragic examples of the devastating effects of the normalcy bias the world has ever seen. Just think about what was going on at the time. Jews were arrested, beaten, taxed, robbed, and jailed for no reason, other than the fact they practiced a particular religion. As a result, they were shipped off to concentration camps. Their houses and businesses were seized. Yet most Jews still didn't leave Nazi Germany because they simply couldn't believe that things would get as bad as they did. That's the normalcy bias with devastating results. We saw the same thing happen during Hurricane Katrina. Even as it became clear that the Levy system was not going to work, tens of thousands of people stayed in their homes, directly in the line of the oncoming waves of water. People had never seen things get this bad before, so they simply didn't believe it could happen. As a result, nearly 2,000 residents died. Again, it's the normalcy bias. We simply refuse to see the evidence that's right in front of our face because it is unlike anything we have experienced before. The normalcy bias kicks in, and we continue to go about our lives as if nothing is unusual or out of the ordinary. Well, we're seeing the same thing happen in the United States right now. We have been the world's most powerful country for nearly 100 years. The U.S. dollar has reigned supreme as the world's reserve currency for more than 50 years. Most of us in America simply cannot fathom these things changing. But I promise you this, things are changing, and faster than most people realize. For a moment, just look at a tiny fraction of the evidence around us. Did you know that there are now nearly 44 million Americans on food stamps? That's nearly 14% of the entire population. Those numbers are up 16% from 2009, and that translates to roughly 1 in 7 Americans. Can a country really be in good shape when 14% of the population can't even afford to buy food? Or how about this? According to a recent article on MSN Money, about 43% of the American families spend more than they earn each year. Look at this chart. It's unbelievable. The average household carries $8,000 in credit card debt, and personal bankruptcies have doubled in the past decade. How in the world can we possibly spend our way out of the current crisis? We certainly can't do it with savings. The only answer is to print more money, which will hasten the fall of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And that brings me to the mystery of disappearing jobs. There's simply no one better at bending statistics than the U.S. government. Take the unemployment rate, for example. Back in the 1930s, anyone without a job but not retired was considered unemployed. Today, however, the government calculates unemployment mainly by counting the number of people receiving unemployment benefits. So when people's benefits expire, they are no longer counted and the unemployment rate actually falls. Ridiculous, I know. But the reality is, the true unemployment rate is much, much higher than what the government is reporting. If you don't believe me, look at two job postings I read about recently. In Long Island City, an estimated 2,000 people waited in line at the local employment office, some for as long as four days, to apply for 100 elevator mechanic apprenticeship positions. We even found a photo of this incredible scene. And in Massillon, Ohio, 700 people recently applied for a single janitorial job, paying $16 an hour plus benefits. The point is, our country is not growing jobs because the government makes it harder and harder for businesses. With current regulations in place, our country will never experience the type of growth necessary 
to dig our government out of the hole they've put themselves in. I'm sure you think I'm exaggerating, but just look at what the CEO of one of America's most important companies said recently. Intel CEO Paul Ottolini said in a recent speech, I can tell you definitively that it costs $1 billion more per factory for me to build, equip, and operate a semiconductor manufacturing facility in the United States. He said that 90% of the additional costs are not from higher labor rates, but from higher taxes and regulatory charges, which other nations simply don't impose. Cypress Semiconductor CEO T.J. Rogers agreed that the problem is not higher U.S. wages, but anti-business laws. He was quoted in an interview with CNET News. The killer factor in California for a manufacturer to create, say, a thousand blue-collar jobs is a hostile government that doesn't want you there and demonstrates it in thousands of ways. Few Americans today realize that we have the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. And since Japan's prime minister announced that his country's corporate tax rate will be cut by 5% at the start of the next fiscal year, the U.S. will soon have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Why would anyone want to start a business here when they can do it for less money and keep more of the money they make by locating elsewhere? It's just another good reason to avoid the U.S. dollar. So is this. The point is, the cards are seriously stacked against us. This looming currency crisis is inevitable. Almost every state in the country is on the verge of bankruptcy. We have borrowed an impossible amount of money which we'll never be able to pay back. Our economy is an absolute mess. Taxes are sky high already and will certainly go much higher over the next few years. And nearly all of the world's major financial players are preparing for an alternative to the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. To me, it is so obvious that we are about to experience a serious currency crisis that I can't believe people deny this reality with a straight face. Again, if you don't believe a currency crisis is coming, just take another look at the price of gold and silver compared to the U.S. dollar over the past decade. Think about this. Silver is up more than 500% since the year 2000. I mean, how high do precious metals have to go before the average American realizes how serious this problem is? To me, it's clear that investors would rather hold gold and silver instead of U.S. dollars. Anyone with any sense or basic understanding of economics can tell the U.S. dollar is doomed and it's going to have major repercussions, which the average American has not yet even considered. So what can you do? Well, I've done a lot of research on this and have found that there are a surprising number of simple things you can do to not only protect what you've currently got, but to also potentially make quite a bit of money as this currency crisis unfolds. Here's what I recommend. So what should you do to protect and possibly even grow your wealth in the next few years? Well, there's a series of pretty simple financial moves I believe you should begin making immediately. And here's something I want you to keep in mind. I'm really only going to talk about your finances here. All of the moves I recommend are simple and fairly straightforward to implement, at least right now. If you wait to do these things, however, they will almost certainly get very expensive, difficult, and even impossible to do. If you do these things now, not only will you be better prepared to weather the coming storm, I believe you could also make quite a bit of money over the next few years. If I'm wrong, well, that's the best part. I think you'd still make very good gains, even if all we get out of this crisis is a mild inflation. You will still be set up to do very, very well. So here are the specific steps you should take. Step number one, get some of your money beyond the reach of the U.S. government. It's perfectly legal and a lot easier than you think. I know you probably don't believe me when I tell you that the U.S. government is going to implement policies to save itself, which are unimaginable right now. But remember, desperate governments will do very desperate things. That's why they outlawed the ownership of gold 80 years ago. That's why they are already talking about nationalizing automatic 401k and retirement plans. And it's why it might soon be against the law to open a foreign bank account or to move your money overseas without paying outrageous taxes. The good news is, I met recently with a man who is considered one of the top asset protection attorneys in America. In short, 
I learned that there are four simple investments you can make right now which you do not have to report to the U.S. government. Don't get me wrong. When and if you ever sell these things years down the road, you are still required to pay taxes on your gains. But the great thing is, while you are holding these investments, so long as you play by the rules, neither you nor anyone else is required to report them to the government. And this benefit should be obvious. The less the government knows about where you have your money, the better. They simply will have a very hard time taking what they don't know you have. I am personally putting a fairly significant portion of my portfolio into one of these assets, and I plan to hold it for a long time. No matter what happens, I know I'll have a significant amount of money that is beyond the government's grasp. I'm not going to tell you exactly what I'm doing here in this video, but I will explain everything in full detail in my new report called The Four Investment Assets You Do Not Have to Report to the U.S. Government, and I will gladly give you access to a copy free of charge. In addition to explaining how I'm protecting my own money, I'll show you three other places you can put your money, which you legally do not have to report to the U.S. government. Of course, normally it would cost you thousands of dollars to meet with my asset protection attorney and to take advantage of his best strategies, but I'll reveal everything you need to know to get started in this report. Plus, I'd like to send you the information on Step number two, how to acquire the world's safest assets, which are likely to perform best during this period. What I'm talking about here is buying as much gold and silver as you can reasonably afford. I know, gold has had a huge run, jumping more than 300% in the past decade. But believe me, when the U.S. dollar loses its status as the world's reserve currency, this early run is going to be a mere afterthought. I will be surprised if gold does not reach $5,000 or $6,000 an ounce in the next few years. The smartest money managers in the world, people like George Soros, David Einhorn, and John Paulson, have all recently taken huge positions in gold, and I think you are crazy not to do the same. How should you do it? There are many options, and my research firm has recently published a great book called The Gold Investor's Bible, which details in full all of the best ways to own and hold gold bullion. In this volume, we reveal dozens of secrets about the gold industry, specifically the best ways to buy, sell, and store your gold. It explains why some gold coins are better than others, how to buy gold with zero dealer markup, how to easily and safely store some of your gold overseas very cheaply, where to hide it, and so much more. Not regularly available for sale, this book is valued at $24. I'd like to give you instant access to a copy, totally free of charge. And what about silver? Well, I believe silver will serve a unique role during this currency crisis. Let me explain. For most of recorded history, the price of gold has been around 16 times the price of silver. This ratio, the so-called silver ratio, has fluctuated from time to time based on silver discoveries and attempts by governments to regulate the silver to gold ratio. But in a free market where demand for silver as money exists, I'd expect the natural supply and demand balance to lead to a silver price around 1 16th times the price of gold. Based on the historical ratio, with the price of gold around $1,500, the price of silver should be around $94. It's not, of course. Today, silver is trading around $38. Today, then, gold is selling for more than 40 times the price of silver. What explains the difference between hundreds of years of history and today? Why is silver still so cheap relative to gold? When silver is demonetized, as it is now, meaning it's not being used for money but just for industrial purposes, supplies soar as people sell silver for gold and other currencies. On the other hand, during periods of monetary crisis, demand for silver as money pushes the silver ratio heavily in silver's favor. For example, the ratio returned to its historic range, 16, during World War I. It happened again in the early 1970s when Nixon abandoned the gold standard. It also happened most famously in 79 and 80 when it seemed as if America was really entering a serious money crisis. 
Most people don't know this, but silver is actually the best performing asset of this century, not gold. Gold has risen from $256 to $1,500 since 2000. That is a rise of 485%. Silver has risen from $4.02 to $38. That is a rise of 845%. In short, silver is the best hedge against a money crisis. As the dollar fails, silver will once again be in demand as money. And as this demand materializes, the free market price of silver will likely return to around one-sixteenth the price of gold. When gold hits $2,000 an ounce, and assuming the price of gold is 16 times the price of silver, silver should be worth about $125 an ounce. My multimillionaire friend and currency expert, Chris Weber, believes silver will likely hit $187 an ounce. If that happens, you could make gains of around 400% if you invest at today's prices. So, what are the best ways to buy silver? Well, my firm has done a ton of research on this precious metal. We have found great ways to hold the metal personally, to have it stored in a secure location in the United States or overseas, and more. We've put everything we know into a valuable guide called Secrets of the Silver Market. I'd like to give you this valuable resource, also free of charge. I'll show you how to get it in a second. But first, let me get to the third financial step I recommend you take right now. Step number three. Learn the 100% secret. If you want the opportunity to make a lot of money during the coming crisis, one sure way to do it is to learn the intricacies of an unusual investment strategy that is now making some investors an absolute fortune. At my research firm, we have been teaching readers this method for several years. And get this, you don't have to buy a single stock to begin using this strategy. And it has nothing to do with shorting. In a nutshell, this is an approach that can enable you to safely extract gains of exactly 100% from the market without ever owning or touching a stock. Keep in mind, this strategy can play out in two very different ways. Though you'll always be able to keep the initial cash you extract from the market, there is a chance you will be required to purchase the underlying stock at a price less favorable than its current market value. So please understand, there is risk involved with this strategy, and it probably won't be right for everyone. But this can be such a sound strategy, especially in times of financial uncertainty, that once you learn how it works, you might decide to never invest the old-fashioned way again. That's why I call this the 100% secret. For example, look at how it has worked for a few of the folks I taught the secret to in recent years. Last March, for example, Peter K., of Boise, Idaho, began using the strategy. He says he now makes an average of $10,000 per month. And Randy B. of Annapolis, Maryland, told me he's made over $87,500 with this technique. Bernard H. of Carmel, Indiana, now collects an average of $100 a day. Another, Harold W. of New Brunswick, New Jersey, has made over $20,000. Tim H., from Sacramento, probably put it best when he wrote me and said, This has saved my portfolio. That's why financial author Lee Lowell writes, I've been a professional trader for 17 years, but many people have never heard of this investment, let alone use the strategy. This is a great way to get your hands on instant cash. Pulitzer Prize winning author James Stewart learned this technique recently and said, these payouts are so rich, I consulted a colleague to make sure they were real. This seldom understood strategy is how we've helped dozens of people make incredible gains, even in a terrible stock market. And in all likelihood, when the stock market gets really bad, as I expect it soon will, this will be an incredibly lucrative and safe strategy. Everything you need to know is in my new report called The 100% Secret the easiest way to make money when stocks are risky. I'll explain exactly how this investment strategy works so you can decide if it's something that might be right for you. And I'll show you how you could begin to take advantage of it starting immediately. Believe me, this is something you want to learn about now because as the stock market begins to unravel, this incredible technique 
will likely get more and more lucrative. And that brings me to step number four. Make sure you own the one asset that can help save you and your family no matter how bad things get. There's no telling exactly how bad things are going to get as this crisis unfolds. I firmly believe there could be riots, marches in the street, bank runs, massive arrests, and periods of uncontrollable mayhem, at least for several months as things begin to unravel. But the good news is that there is one asset you can own, now widely available in America, which should help protect you and your family from this chaos and could also likely make you a fortune in the years to come. I'm not talking about guns or bonds or gold or other precious metals or anything like that. And of course, this has absolutely nothing to do with the stock market. What I'm talking about is a very powerful asset that wealthy families have used for centuries to protect themselves and preserve and build their fortunes. An index tracking this asset has absolutely crushed the stock market between 1991 and 2009 by returning more than 13,000% during that period. Best of all, it provided these gains with almost no volatility. Just look at this chart. See how that blue line goes straight up without any hiccups? Multi-millionaire investor Barton Biggs wrote that this type of asset throughout history protected both your wealth and your life. During World War II, for example, when millions of families lost their entire life savings through inflation or government seizure, this was the one asset that enabled some families to protect, preserve, and grow their money. What the average American doesn't realize is that many of the richest people in the United States have a significant ownership stake in this asset. The Walton family of Walmart fame, Bill Gates, Ted Turner, the Hilton family, Charles Schwab, Microsoft billionaire Paul Allen, the Hunt family of Texas oil fame, the Hearst family, the Ford family, and more. As I mentioned, you can easily make this investment today here in America. Probably less than 1% of the population owns it today, but it is readily available and fairly inexpensive. I've written up all the details and everything you need to know. My report is called the world's most valuable asset in a time of crisis. There are several ways to make this investment. I'll show you what they are. Like I said, this has nothing to do with stocks, bonds, precious metals, guns, medicine, or anything like that, yet it could save your family and make you very wealthy in the coming years. As my multimillionaire friend Doug Casey says, it's the one thing you should own in the years to come. I don't want to say any more about it than that here in this video. The truth is, the fewer people who know about this investment secret, the better. So how can you begin taking these simple steps right away? Well, my company, Stansberry & Associates Investment Research, is a financial research firm. We have a staff of about 50 people, and our main objective is to find safe and profitable investment ideas that you are not likely to hear about anywhere else. Since we started this business a decade ago, we have helped a lot of people make a lot of money. Harold T. from Montana wrote recently to say, My IRA has gone from a low of $315,000 to the present high of $952,000. I can only thank your Redditors for changing my life so much. Dan K. from San Diego also contacted us recently to say, since joining, my portfolio has grown by several hundred thousand dollars. I look forward to a long and prosperous relationship. We even got an interesting note recently from a reader named Ulysses Reuter, who says he has been making a small killing, enough to buy a nice-sized boat and a house in Mexico. Here's the photo he sent. He writes, We took delivery of her three weeks ago and are cruising the Bahamas. In October, we will take her through the Panama Canal over to the Pacific side since I just bought a home in Mexico. Then there was the nice note from Mitchell D. from Ithaca, New York. I was working long hours with overtime to make a living when I joined you. The excellent results have allowed me to retire early. Believe me, nothing makes me feel better than receiving notes like these. But I have to tell you, right now, I am really worried that a lot of our subscribers and many, many hardworking Americans are going to get 
caught totally by surprise when this inevitable crisis hits. That's why I created this presentation, and that's why I like to send you the full details on exactly how I believe this is all going to unfold and exactly how to protect yourself and even prosper during this crisis. Remember, the government is not going to save you. You can either let things happen to you, or you can take a few simple steps and take charge of your family's fate. As I mentioned earlier, when we began writing about the looming collapse of the bond market and the risk to the U.S. dollar, a lot of people called us right-wing nutjobs or gold bugs. But that was when silver was still less than $20, when gold was under 1000 That was before food prices soared, before the Fed began to print trillions of new dollars every year and to use these dollars to buy our own bonds in one of the great Ponzi schemes of all time. That was before folks realized most of the states are going bankrupt, before they saw that even doubling taxes wouldn't end our annual deficit. We knew all of these things were going to happen, even though it was hard to believe our own conclusions. And we know all of these problems are going to get a lot worse. The fact is, we can't afford our debts. We can't stop printing money. And as a result, we're going to see a massive dollar crisis. The only question is, what will it take for you to recognize the crisis I've been warning about? How high will gold have to go? How many banks will have to be seized by the FDIC? How high will oil have to soar? Or food prices? Or foreign currencies? When will you finally realize there's a problem? Even the Wall Street Journal can see the writing on the wall. They ran a story on March 2nd of this year called, Why the Dollar's Reign is Near an End. I hope you will act now. When the situation finally turns, it will happen suddenly. If our government suddenly finds itself unable to sell bonds at a reasonable price, the rule of law will evaporate overnight. Most people will do nothing. They will continue to assume tomorrow is likely to be pretty much the same. These people are going to get wiped out. Please, don't let that happen to you and your family. The nice thing is, you can give my research a look, receive everything I've mentioned here, at absolutely no risk or obligation. Simply let me know you'd like to take a trial subscription to my monthly newsletter called Stansberry's Investment Advisory, and I will immediately give you access to Research report number one, the four investment assets you do not have to report to the U.S. government. Research report number two, the gold investor's Bible. Research report number three, secrets of the silver market. Research report number four, the 100% secret, the easiest way to make money when stocks are risky. And research report number five, the world's most valuable asset in a time of crisis. Also, On the second Friday of each month, I'll send you my monthly newsletter, Stansberry's Investment Advisory. I'll keep you up to date on exactly what's going on regarding this financial crisis, and I'll show you some unusual and incredible ways to make money now and as it begins to unfold. We have found some great ways to make a fortune as the government continues to try to bail out one failing industry after another. I'll also keep you up to date on what I am doing to protect myself. I'll make sure you stay abreast of changes to the laws and government interventions. And every day the markets are open, I'll send you my paid subscribers-only email called the Stansberry & Associates Digest. In short, I report on all the work my firm is doing, the most interesting investment ideas, what we're researching now, and what we expect to happen in the months to come. So how much does my work cost, and how can you get started? Well, a one-year subscription, including everything I mentioned here, normally costs $99 per year. That's what many others have paid. But right now, you can try my research for half off the normal rate. You'll pay just $49.50 for an entire year. Why so cheap? Well, to be honest, our business really only works if our subscribers stick with us for the long term. But we realize you've got to try our work first to see if it's right for you. And that's why, through this video, we're making it so cheap and essentially risk-free to try. What I mean is, you'll have the next four months to take a look at the research reports I've just described, plus the next four issues of my newsletter, and the next four months of my daily digest reports. If you decide for any reason my work is not right for you, just let us know, and you can receive a full refund to keep everything you've received so far. In other words, 
By taking me up on this offer, you are agreeing only to try my work to see if you like it. I hope you'll consider this offer seriously. I know in my heart it will be one of the best financial moves you ever make. To get started, simply click on the subscribe now button below, which will take you to a secure order form. Your order will be processed immediately, and you'll have access to all my work in a matter of minutes.